So my next destination is Seattle, Washington, home of Starbucks, Amazon, and Intel Labs Seattle. Uh, my name is Dieter Fox. I am a director of the Intel Labs here in Seattle, and I'm also faculty at the University of Washington. Um, so Intel Labs Seattle is a research organization within Intel, and the, the goal of these uh, labs is really to investigate the future possibilities of computing. So in a sense, looking at what will be, uh, what can we use computing devices in the future, like five, ten years ahead. And uh, these labs really have a very close collaboration with the university. That is also part of our charter, to have very close ties with the university. And that is why they came up with this idea that every three years one of the faculty becomes director of one of those uh, research labs. There are two more of these research labs. One is um, in Pittsburgh with the Car Carnegie Mellon University and another one in Berkeley with the University of California in Berkeley. Um, the, the, the work that we've been looking at in, the, in the, the most recent year, let's say, was really focusing a lot on using depth cameras, kind of that's what brought up this connection here. Is, uh, so about uh, one and a half years ago, we got in touch with PrimeSense, which is actually the company that built the depth cameras that are underlying the Microsoft Kinect system. And um, because we're part of Intel, so we were able to also get um, early prototypes of these cameras. And about uh, a year ago, we started really looking at different scenarios that could be enabled with these kind of systems. Um, uh, so we, we decided to see what will be possible with depth cameras uh, beyond, let's say, the kind of uh, body tracking and gaming, but rather w w what are the next steps that can be, be done there. And uh, the specific scenarios we investigated were things like building 3D models of your environments, building 3D models of objects. So in a broader sense, it's in a sense, how can we bring the 3D world around you into your computer? Mm. And once you have it in 3D in your computer, you can start interacting with it, right? So imagine if everybody could build a 3D model of their house, you could then um, uh, do virtual furniture shopping. Maybe you can download a 3D model of a sofa, put it in your home environment and can see how it fits into your place. You can do also for realtor, for example, you can, um, for people who, who are interested in buying a house, you can maybe do a virtual walk through the building that you're interested in. You can imagine for architects at remodeling, you can automatically generate architectural drawings. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the opportunities here are really endless. And um, other scenarios are a 3D modeling of objects and object recognition, which has always been a really, really hard task for the computer vision community. And we believe that using depth cameras in addition to the visual uh, color information that we get can really improve these systems. Um, other systems that we've been looking at are interactive tabletop kind of um, systems like the Oasis project, where the goal is really to see how we can um, turn every everyday surfaces into interactive systems. So one, one example would be a kitchen scenario while you're cooking. There could be a projector and a depth camera under your cabinets in the kitchen projecting on the countertop and then, for example, mm -hmm. it might help you cooking certain recipes and things like that. Another scenario that is now really popular is looking at the future of how you can play Lego, how you can you do interactive gaming with Lego and using depth camera and projector systems. Okay. So the, the research underneath or the techniques that we are applying are very much related to the computer vision techniques that have been used for, let's say, purely color-based uh, information. So we are using actually a combination of color information and depth or shape information. So it's not solidly based on the depth information that you get out of these cameras. Mm -hmm. And also the, the closely related research community is the robotics community where I am coming more from. And there are tasks like building maps of environments are kind of standard tasks that we've been looking at uh, for over a decade now. And I believe that these depth cameras can also have a huge impact in that community. I think where the, the real impact is coming if we go into more unstructured environments. So for example, getting robots into home environments, service robots helping people, or robots helping elderly people stay more independent, lead an independent life. Um, other applications could be, you see this already now popping up on the internet, are people maybe putting it on vacuum cleaning robots. And uh, another key contribution with these new cameras is really also the price point. Right. So far, if you wanted uh, uh, a depth camera, it would cost $5,000 at least. And, and now suddenly we can have that at $150 in a sense. Right? Right. So I think um, 
you can imagine putting this on, on a vacuum cleaning robot and suddenly it becomes a robot that can build maps of your house and you can interact with it using gesture recognition. Uh, it's interesting how the Kinect's only been out for not even a month and the amount of hacks that one sees and the way that people are using it just continue to grow. So it makes me think of, you know, uh, where, you know, this time for sure, you know, next year, um, some of the things that we'll see. So, so what are kind yeah. of your thoughts? Uh, First, I totally agree. I, it, it's amazing what's going on and how fast it actually goes, right? It took, I think, two days until the first hacked versions came out. Um, and over the last years, we've been thinking a lot that Clearly, this will have a huge impact on robotics and um, human-computer interaction communities. Um, but even we're, we're really surprised by how fast things take off. And I think it will have a real big impact on, um, in a sense, bringing computer vision kind of applications to the masses, making it really robust enough so that you can put it, for example, into a computer gaming environment. Right? Um, I think uh, big scenarios will be this kind of enabling everybody to start building 3D models of whatever they, they want, uh, making computers much more aware of the environment, for example, by adding more robust object recognition capabilities. Um, also, of course, the gesture-based interfaces will be crucial and they will improve a lot over the next, the next years or months even. You can imagine that it's not only about interacting with, with your laptop, but you will have large projector-based systems that just you interact with, for example, that project things on the walls in your house and things like that. I, I, I love it so far. It's, it's been really great. The advantage for me also with uh, working here in the Intel Labs is uh, that on the one hand side, the work that we're doing here is extremely related to my research project at the university. So many of my students actually spend a lot of time here in the lab. Okay. And here they can do research and they have access to, for example, to camera systems that otherwise they wouldn't have access to, like the, the PrimeSense cameras. Um, and it's also nice to work on, on projects that uh, could have an immediate relevance to, to many, many people out there. Mm -hmm. right? So it's been, so far it's been real fun. Excellent. And what can you tell us a little bit about the research you're doing over at U UW? The research there is very much related also to um, uh, let's say extracting high level information from sensor data is uh, very much about statistical uh, techniques, um, activity recognition. So for example the robotics work that now we're also doing here in the lab is very much related to how can we build robots that um, we can interact it with in a very natural way. So for example how can we make robots learn about natural language instructions. Okay. So for instance we are doing a project right now uh, where we built a small manipulator that for example you could play interactive games with so the first thing we did is just as a starter project was playing chess but we want to look at for example maybe having a small robot you could play lego with and you could tell the robot what pieces to hand over to you and the robot learns over time so the real task is kind of making these these humans and robots um, collaborate in a very natural way through for example gesture interfaces and natural language interfaces and AI and machine learning techniques are going to be crucial, I think, in order to enable these systems. Um, other applications are also in the robotics domain, and again, that's a lot of work that, that we're doing here in the lab as well, is um, how can we enable robots to better understand the world around them? So for instance, related to object recognition, right now, I think we'll, we'll not be able to build a robot that you could put in your house, and it will know all the objects that you have. Right? But I think if we can, uh, build robots that can go in the environment and learn over time. So, for example, the robot could pick up an object and take a look at it, right, and then put it down again and remember what it was and maybe build a 3D model of it. Then uh, it can become smarter and smarter over time. And I think this is also going to be a, a crucial component of those systems. And maybe w w one remark I should do is also uh, what is nice about this this collaboration here between the University of Washington and, and the Intel lab here is really that uh, Intel came up with this what they call is this open collaborative research environment yeah. where the idea is that we have some really close projects with students and faculty at the universities and this is all um, openly publishable work so as you can imagine for people in the research community it's very important that they can publish their work at conferences and um, in, in journals and uh, can be very open about this and actually the collaboration that we're doing here with Intel 
is uh, of this nature. So, for instance, many of the students spend most of the time there here in the lab and they can really publish their work. So there's no closed IP involved so um, that they can really leverage that also for their PhD research, for example. So what are some of the other things that, that you're working on here at the lab that you're um, at liberty so to share? So we're looking, so the lab, the, let's say the research theme of the lab is really sensor-driven context-aware systems, which means how can we build computer systems that become much more aware of about the environment. Right now you see this already in smartphones coming up more and more, that for example, um, the, the smartphone knows where you are, your location based on Wi-Fi um, access points or based on GPS, but I think uh, where we want to go more and more is that these systems really know, for example, or, or realize uh, which objects you are interacting with. For example, you can imagine in the context of, of elderly people enabling a more independent life for these people would be possible if you have a system or an environment for them that can support them achieving their tasks. So one thing could be, for example, in the cooking or keeping track of their health status by just observing what kind of activities they are doing. And I think we can automate many of those things and thereby enable people to, to live a more independent life. Um, of course, one of the key questions with more and more sensing coming up is also going to be privacy. Right. right? Because these computer systems, smartphones and, and, and search engines, they all start knowing more and more about our lives. So how can we ensure that the data that is being shared uh, is only shared with appropriate parties and also that the people who use those kind of systems are aware of what kind of data is being shared. So we have one, one project that's called AppScope, for example, that can look at, for instance, on uh, for applications that you run in your Android environment, what kind of data they share without even, in a sense, telling you, right? So the people can become much more aware of what is going on. Another thing that is going to happen, of course, um, is with Kinect-like systems that there will be other applications for them, and we see this already coming up. So now imagine you have in your house, you suddenly might have a camera, and you want to make sure, for example, that that camera is only recording data that you want it to record, and that is really only necessary for the context you apply it in. Mm -hmm. So uh, how can we enable systems that control this and make sure that, for example, certain data doesn't just get published to a web service or something like that? So we're also very much aware of of uh, those sensitivities and, and doing research in that area. Uh, there's also work going on in um, how we can use RFID tags, smart RFID tags that also are programmable or that um, th that we can put sensing into those RFID tags so that they can, for example, sense when you shake them or move them around. Um, other research areas are, of course, very much related to human-computer interactions, so very much like the OASIS system, for example. We've also looked at scenarios where you have these kind of smart spaces around your laptop, so using, for example, projectors and cameras or depth cameras in combination to generate those smart spaces. Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of work now going on in the robotics domain. How can we do um, mobile robot manipulation and how can we enable more object recognition on, on robotics.